Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so right now I'm at school, so that's why I'm wearing a mask. Um, but I wanted to go over a couple things uh, regarding glazes because of uh, where we're going to be um, here in this last couple of, we've, of weeks of instruction before finals. So um, I'm at school. I'm going to show you a couple, guys a couple of things. We're going to talk a little bit about glazes. I'm also going to go over the, a few of the different kinds of glazes that we have that are mixed up and ready to go for you guys. Um, and then we're also going to talk about just um, firing in general and what that firing means. Um, so far in your work that you've come and you've dropped off, that work has um, gone through what's called a bisque fire kiln. And that bisque fire kiln um, goes up to um, about cone 06. We're going to talk about what cones are in just a moment. And cone 06 is, uh, can you know, be in, in anywhere in and around like 1820 some degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about cones and what those means. Pyro, they're called pyrometric cones. We're going to go over a little bit of a cone chart so you guys can get a little bit of uh, the fundamentals of firing and cones and what that means. And um, then we're going to take a look at some different glazes so you can see what those glazes look like. And then we are going to uh, finish up with me showing you guys how to dip glazes so that when you come in here, we can get that done relatively quickly on uh, the pieces that we've made for the semester. So this will be kind of the last thing that we do in class other than a term test. And we'll have a little bit of something up for that term test as well um, coming on the first week once we come back from the break. Um, so uh, let's go over pyrometric cones. All right, gang, here are a couple of cones. Uh, this is cone 9 and cone 10. They all have number values, and we're going to talk about those number values here in a second. Um, so uh, this is um, a, what's called a cone pack. It's ready to go into a kiln. So these cones are set up. They're actually physical things that are called cones, and they have this kind of cone shape to them, a fl no, three flat sides. All right, it's hard to kind of see that other part. There we go. Three flat sides, and they uh, get set up so they're at about a three degree um, angle so that that way when they're in the kiln, once it gets to a specific melt, then those will actually start to bend over and they'll start to curl over. And I'm going to show you with my finger, they'll be up like this. And then when they fire, they'll start to go like this. And as they curl down, once that tip reaches the shelf or whatever it's sitting on, that's when it reaches that specific uh, melt, all right? And notice I'm not saying temperature, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about temperatures here in a second, but as we talk about them, we're also going to talk about melts, all right, and what that means. So pyrometric cones this is how it's spelled. Pyrometric, okay, cones, right like that, okay? That's, they're meant to uh, basically give us the degree of melt, all right, now, what we have here is a simple cone chart. There's lots of uh, cone charts that are out there, but I'm going to kind of go along the length of this really quickly. You don't have to know any of these numbers at all. It is not important for you guys to know number values at all in any way, shape, or form. We, I just want you to understand that the, way, the way that the cone chart works. So at the lowest possible temperature, we call this is around 022. So cone, that's that triangle that we see here, right? That triangle means cone, okay? Then there's a zero that's shown there, okay? And then a two and a two, so zero, 22. At the low end of this, you'll notice that as I go and I start to get higher in temperature, so we started out at um, 1087 degrees Fahrenheit, we'll go with that top temperature. We're gonna talk about the bottom temperature in just a moment. As we go here and we get to cone 06, right? We've gotten into the single digits there, essentially, cone 06, that zero being in front of it basically is almost like a negative number. Because as we go up in temperature, 1828 to 1888 from cone 06 to 05, notice that the number got lower, right? Cone 06, then cone 05, then cone 04, works just like negative numbers. Then eventually we'd get to cone 1 the absence of that zero. There's no more zero in front of anything, okay? So this is just cone one. Now we're at 2,079 degrees Fahrenheit. Then from cone one, as we go up in temperature, right, 
then we start to see the numbers increase, cone six, cone seven, cone eight, cone nine, cone 10. Whereas at the lower end of the scale, this would have been like 04, 05, 06, as it's going lower in temperature than 07, then 08, 09, 010, till you get to 022 at the very lowest end of the pyrometric cone chart for us here in ceramics, okay? So what's important to know is that at the lower end of the scale, you have that cone 022. So we have cone 06 right here at 1828 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, you don't need to know these numbers. And then we have cone six, right? They sound very similar. What's the difference between those two? The difference is, is there's a zero in front of this one at that lower end of the firing, right? Or into the temperature. And as we get up here to cone six, the numeric value of temperature increases, okay? So if you ever see, there's lots of different areas where clays and glazes um, are used, all right? This, there's no clay that fires at 022, but there are things like lusters, things that make golds and platinums and all the uh, kind of metal, very metallic look, uh, looking um, glazes and even uh, mother of pearl that gives it like that iridescent look. Those happen at that real low range firing, okay? Even some um, china paints maybe are that low, but most of the china paints are actually at about 018, right? Cone 018. And then cone 06, that's what we bisque fired your work to. That was that first firing. Basically what that first firing does is it makes all of those, or it causes what's called quartz inversion, which happens pretty much lower than that 1828 degree um, kind of range. Um, quartz inversion is gonna happen, so all of the silica molecules are gonna bond together and when all those silica molecules bond together, it changes from being clay and becomes ceramic, okay? So that's where we bisque fire to, B-I-S-Q-U-E. Again, that's spelled B-I-S-Q-U-E. I'll even write it up here. Okay, bisque, all right? So for what we're doing in this class, um, and here at Riverside City College, when we glaze fire, we glaze fire up here at this range, cone 10, up at the higher end. This is not the highest. It actually goes up to maybe about cone 15 or something like that. Um, but you don't get a lot of stuff happening at cone 15. Um, in China, they fire up to about cone 14, cone 15, and some wood fire ceramics will go up that high as well. A lot of that is porcelain, okay? Porcelain is a slightly different clay, a type of clay than what we're using. But we're basically firing here at around this cone 10 range. And so this is gonna be our glaze, G-L-A-Z-E fire, okay? That's at about 2,345 degrees, okay? Now notice this lower number says 2,381. And this is where we need to, this is what we really need to know about pyrometric cones and about firing in ceramics. Firing in ceramics is not about temperature. A pyrometric cone is set to melt. It uses a time and temperature variable, okay? So it's not just one thing. It's about, it's, it's a little bit more, it, there's something about time and there's um, also, it's about how quickly you're um, firing the kiln at the end of the firing. So at the very end of the firing for the last hour, if you fire and you increase for the last 180 degrees of the firing, if you, inc if you uh, are increasing your temperature during the last 180 degrees of the firing, 108 degrees Fahrenheit per hour, then your melt temperature is gonna be at 1087 for 022. But if you're speeding up that firing and you're going at about 270 degrees per hour, for that last 180 degrees of firing, then your melt temperature is gonna increase. So the temperature doesn't always stay the same. It's not like baking cookies, right? If we were baking cookies, it says, you know, 350 degrees, you leave it in there for 18 minutes, a little bit longer for brownies or whatever, and voila, you've got brownies, and you test it with your little fork and you find out whether or not it's done. We can't do that with ceramics. We need to know that those glazes have melted. And that's what we're trying to have happen in this portion of the firing is we're trying to get the glazes to melt because glaze 
is a super cooled liquid, it's glass, okay? Whether or not you know this, glass is a liquid. Glass is not a solid. Even though it acts like a solid, it has no, um, it, it has a random molecular structure. It doesn't have a structure molecularly at all. It's random. And so because of that, it has to be classified as a liquid, not a solid. So this is what I want you to understand is that O22 is not always 1087 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not always 1094. In fact, if you slow this down and don't even go 108 degrees per hour for the last 180 degrees of the firing, you could actually fire to O22 and have a lower degree Fahrenheit for the end firing temperature. So it's not about that temperature, it's a temperature and time, okay? Or temperature and maybe, uh, I mean, time is kind of a good way to think about it, but it really has to do with how quickly, right, we're, um, how fast we're firing the kiln. Are we firing it at 108 degree, eight degrees per hour, or are we firing at 270 degrees Fahrenheit per hour, or are we somewhere else in the range? Are we down at 20, if we stall the kiln out and really slow it down, and increase the amount of time, then we're increasing that at a lower temperature than a, or a lower temperature rate than 108 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Maybe we're doing it at 20 degrees per hour. That's gonna change this number significantly. It's gonna go down in temperature, okay? Notice here, when we speed the kiln up, it goes up in temperature. When we slow the kiln down, it goes lower in temperature. So don't think, of these cone values as equaling always exactly a specific degree Fahrenheit. So if anyone were to ask you, what's the temperature of cone 10? If you were to ask, or if you were to answer and say, oh, the temperature of cone 10 is 2345 degrees. And then a ceramic artist said to you, or somebody in ceramics said, well, explain your answer. Then you would have to say, well, it would be 2345 degrees Fahrenheit if for the last 180 degrees of the firing, you increased your temperature at 108 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. That's the only way that cone 10 is going to equal 2345 degrees Fahrenheit. So that right there is why we don't go by temperatures when we measure kilns, we go by cones. We put these little things inside of there. They've been specifically formulated to melt at cone 10. They haven't been formulated to melt at 2345 or 2381. They've been formulated to melt at cone 10. And that's how we formulate our glazes. So if we have glazes that are made to fire at cone 10, then we're gonna use a cone 10 cone inside of the kiln. And some people ask, well, why then do we have two cones here? Why do we see cone nine and cone 10? The reason why we do that is so we can have what's called a witness cone, right? Sometimes we even put a cone 11 in there and the cone 11 will let us know whether or not we got too much of a cone 10, like a, a, a hard cone 10 or a, or a hot cone 10, or if we got right at cone 10. Because if we had a cone 11 cone in the kiln at the time with this, we might see the cone 11 cone start to bend just slightly, right? But the cone nine one will be flat. Okay, the cone 10 when we're waiting just for the tip of that to end, kind of curl over, like I said, it curls over like this. And then as soon as it touches the shelf, say my thumb is the shelf, that's when we've reached cone 10. And at that point in time, cone 11 would have been up here. Maybe cone 11's down like this because it's starting to get a little soft. It's starting to move. But that doesn't mean it's reached cone 11. It only has reached cone 11 when the 11 goes all the way down and touches. Right, so that's why we use the cones as our indicator inside of the kilns, okay? It's a very important scale to understand. So we start with our zero in front of everything with our high number values, 022, 23, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, cone zero, 1, then cone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and on up to about cone 15, right? But for our class, we fire right here, cone 10 for our glaze. Anybody remember what we did for our bisque firing? 
the bisque firing, the very first firing, where we get quartz inversion and we change all those, or we create a nice matrix with all our silica molecules. That's at cone 06. Not at cone 6. Cone 6 is way over there. You can't even see it. Whoa, it's way over there. We get it at 06, not cone 6, because the difference in, in and around our temp temperature values, cone 06 is at 1800, around 1,828 degrees Fahrenheit, and cone 6 is all the way up at 2,232. And that's a large difference, 18 to 22. It doesn't seem like that much, right? It's really only 400 degrees difference, okay? But 400 degrees difference in a kiln firing makes a big difference. If you were to take clay that's meant to fire at cone 06, and you were to fire it at cone 6, at cone 6, it'll melt into a puddle and maybe even become shiny like a glaze and turn to glass, right? So big things can change and a lot of mistakes can be made. So we don't want to fire clay that's been made to fire to 06 or cone 06, we want to fire it at that lower range. We don't want to try and take it up to this level. But if we fire something like a cone 6 clay, or maybe even a cone 10 clay like what we have, if we fire a cone 10 clay at cone 6, like we've already done for our bis firing, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It just hasn't come to maturity yet. A, a, uh, gl uh, clay becoming mature means that it starts to become vitreous. And up here at the higher end of the spectrum, where we call this stuff stoneware, right? Anything that's up here at the high end of the spectrum is stoneware. And anywhere down here that's at the lower end, in and around 06, and maybe even up to like even cone two, 1 or 2 or 3, that stuff is called earthenware. E-A-R-T-H-E-N, where, W-A-R-E, okay? All one word, earthenware. This stuff is called stoneware because it becomes harder. It's like a stone, okay, when it gets to those um, higher temperature values, and it becomes vitreous, okay? If you think about down here about Kono 6, Kono 6 is where we have a type of clay that you guys might be familiar with. It's called, wait for it, Terracotta. Terracotta is what they use to make a lot of pot, uh, pots for um, planting uh, plants inside of, okay? Flowers, shrubs, herbs, all sorts of things like that. A lot of times those get, um, get uh, planted in earthenware or terracotta type pots. And terracotta pots are great for that because down at this lower level, they don't really become, the, this kind of clay doesn't become vitreous. It doesn't get a sheen to it. It doesn't become really all that shiny until you put glaze on it. It also is not water resistant, okay? Something like a terracotta pot is used for planting because if you pour water into it, water can seep out of it. And if water seeps out of it, it just goes right in through the clay and it will slowly seep out of it. And that's good for planting because we don't want our soil and our pot or, or the, uh, the plant we're planting or, or growing, we don't want it to become rotten inside. We don't want it to actually become and start to get like moldy and gross inside of there because it'll actually die on you if that happens. So that's what kind of happens when you have these um, clay bodies like low fire stuff that's uh, similar to terracotta, it needs to have a glaze in order to be um, watertight to where water won't flow through it. If you put a whole bunch of water inside of terracotta and you let it sit there for a long period of time, it would actually just soak out of it completely eventually, right? If you were to do that with these stoneware clays up here at the higher range, um, you know, anywhere from like around cone three or cone four all the way up to cone 10 and 15, these are vitreous clay bodies. The clay without any glaze on it, on its own, it has very little water absorption. We're talking like one, two, three percent, right? Very, very little water absorption. They're vitreous. That's what vitreous means, is that it has a slight sheen to the, to the material itself without glaze being on it. And what that gives you is it gives you a watertight vessel without glaze. 
Then you put glaze on top of it and it becomes sanitary, right? It's one of the reasons why we have glaze, okay? Really quickly, we're gonna talk about a couple reasons why we use glaze. There's kind of three main reasons why we use glaze. And one of the reasons why you use glaze is for an aesthetic. We want it to look a certain way, all right? We want it to be a certain color. And so when we want that, we use glaze, okay? The other reason why we use glaze is because it actually strengthens the object. It, it puts a, a very thin shell around our objects on both sides typically, right? And it's baby, basically kind of cradling that clay on the inside. And this is, does, is not just a surface treatment. The glaze itself will fuse to the clay, right? Because there's actually clay that's inside of all the glazes and there's clay in that clay or silica, right? And so basically what we're talking about here is we've got um, a couple different materials that make up those clay and they'll bond to one another and they'll create this um, fusion. And so the glaze actually becomes part of the pot. It's not just like paint. If we paint something, it just is a surface treatment. If you were to break apart a piece of ceramic and look on the inside, you'll see this fusion layer where those two layers come together. All right, so it gives us an aesthetic or our, our color or our pattern or whatever that happens to be. It can also give us um, that strength. And then the last thing that glaze that will give us for the most part is it's gonna give us a sanitary surface right? As long as it's the right type of glaze, okay? Because one of the main reasons why we use glaze on pottery is so that we can eat out of our pottery. If we have a really rough surface, like some clays are very rough, and if we have a really rough surface, then we're not going to be able to clean that object very, um, uh, very well, okay? It's, gonna be, it's a lot harder to clean rough, clean rough surfaces than it is to clean a smooth surface. And we get, when we get that glass-like layer of glaze on it, that's what happens is that we get a sanitary surface, something that we can clean off, something that's not gonna absorb in, something that if I had a raw piece of chicken and it sat there, or if just a cooked piece of chicken, and it sat there for a long period of time, it wouldn't absorb into the clay body like that terracotta we talked about earlier, the earthenware. If it were to soak in and you were to get some of that material from you know even a cooked piece of chicken, if you left a cooked piece of chicken out for long enough, it would start to grow bacteria. And even if it's just chicken juice that's inside of terracotta and soaked inside of the clay, it will start to create bacteria. And then that's gonna be a non-sanitary surface. So we use that glaze to create a sanitary surface, okay? So those are three main reasons why, I have why we have uh, glaze, all right? Or why we use glaze in pottery. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some of these glazes. There's gonna be a little bit of reflection from the lights in here. So just kind of look a little bit at the color and I'll hold some of these up as well. The first one I'm gonna start with is this one called Vegas Red, okay? So Vegas Red, you can see that in some spots it's not very red, okay? It has a slight little green tinge to it, all right? This area where it's red, it becomes a little bit more opaque and then where the greenish color is, this becomes a little bit more transparent. There are some glazes that are semi-transparent. There are some glazes that are totally transparent, meaning we can see through them. And then there's some glazes that are completely opaque, meaning we can't see anything through them. All right, and so then also what happens with glaze is like this with Vegas Red, if you look at it, there's some variation that's there, even on these little edges, okay? Those little edges, you can kind of see that the edge breaks a little bit where there's a high spot. It breaks away from that high, high spot and we see that different color. We'll see that happen on a few of these different glazes and we're just gonna go through these quickly so it's not too, doesn't take too long. All the glazes that I have here that I'm showing you, except for those two that are over there, we're gonna talk about those in a second. All these are on the Hopkins white clay, which I believe is what all of you guys have been using. This is our clear glaze. Now, this is a clear glaze on a marbled piece of clay, okay? So this is not just on that Hopkins white, <clears throat> but the Hopkins white is the white part that you see in here, right? So clear is gonna be 100% clear. That's what this stuff is made to do. It's made to be as clear as possible. But if you marble clay, you can see that a different clay body, you can see through it and see something different. This clay body that's down through there, I believe, if I'm right, it's a 
clay body that we have that's called black mountain clay. It's a dark, very dark clay. Pardon me. Eggshell. This is a white clay that has a very soft kind of look to it. And if you see the other ones that we've been looking at so far, those uh, pieces have been really shiny. This one has a little bit more of a matte surface. It's actually more of a satin surface. You can see a little bit of a sheen to it there if I get in there, right? But not too much. So eggshell is gonna create mostly a white look. Cobalt blue, this is a very deep kind of royal blue color. Um, this one breaks a little bit too. If we look at these little marks that are down here, we can see on those edges how it's broken away a little bit, okay? <clears throat> this is a glaze called fake ash. It's kind of hard to see. This is a semi kind of, uh, kind of a matte glaze somewhere around, somewhere between a shiny and a satin glaze, okay? This one's called black suede. It's a black color, but it's a very, very almost eggshell soft has kind of that soft look to it, that satiny look to it. Okay, it doesn't really reflect the light, it kind of absorbs the light. So that is the black suede, okay? You notice that too, on the bottom, all these bottoms, there's no glaze here. That's where it sits on the table, all right? That's where it sits on the shelf when it's in the kiln, all right? We've got lipstick purple. This one breaks quite a bit. You can see on this edge how you can see the brown. That's the brown of the clay coming through, okay? <clears throat> All right, we've got copper teal. This one is a, a, a glaze that's using a pretty good amount of uh, copper, the metal copper, okay? We use a lot of things, a lot of heavy metals in ceramics, the cobalt, right? Cobalt is a metal as well. This one that's a Ohada, it's a, I, I would call it like an Ohada red. <clears throat> and um, this Ohada glaze is probably a very high iron glaze, uh, but then there's some other materials in it to get it to go that color as well. That's a transparent, or sorry, that's a uh, opaque glaze. Lipstick purple, opaque. Black suede, opaque. Fake ash, opaque, all right? Eggshell, opaque. Winokur yellow, which we talked about already, right? Opaque. <clears throat> We've got this one green to black. They call it green to black because where it's thick, it's gonna be green, and where it's thin, it's gonna have a darker appearance, okay? It's not really gonna be black, but it's gonna be a darker appearance. You can kind of see, instead of it being brown, it has like a very dark brown, rather than like that lipstick purple one that was a, <clears throat> a little bit of a lighter brown. This is a Temoku. It's a kind of a spelled differently, T-E-N-M-O-K-U. This is a Japanese style high iron glaze that gives us blacks and browns and almost this like red, these reddish colors. Lots of variation, all in one glaze, okay? This is just one glaze and that's it. Jet black, all three of those, green to black, Temoku and jet black, all of those are uh, tran or, uh, opaque glazes, okay? Then we've got this one, beer bottle brown. This is kind of like a honey, okay? This is a transparent glaze. We can see through it. So if there's any carvings that you made, um, if you did any texture or anything like that, sometimes it's a really good idea to look for a glaze that's transparent to, to use for that. So if we like turn it over and take a look at this part, we can really see those lines, right? These lines that have been created in between here. Uh, the differences in textures, right? Or we wanna choose something like this because this lipstick purple one, this one breaks really nicely, okay? You get those kind of breaks, or the green to black, right? Green to black, you get some of those breaks as well, okay? So you wanna find something that's gonna help the surface of the uh, piece that you're doing. This one's called brown to black, and this one appears, I haven't used this one before, but it appears to me that this one is a opaque glaze. So we're not gonna see much of a carving from underneath, but maybe we might see a little bit. Tea dust, this one's kind of a cool one. It's a very high iron glaze, uh, but it has these kind of yellowish little dots that happen that give it that interesting tea. Uh, like, like they, that's why they call it tea dust. It's like got this little dusting of color, okay? It's like a greenish yellow, so I think that's why they go and call, or they end up calling it tea dust. But this one breaks, but it breaks this really beautiful orange color. 
all right? Kind of like what the Temoku does. Temoku will break that really cool orange as well, all right? This is our clear base, right? Just the clear like we looked at earlier. It's, this is just on a slightly different clay body than what we saw. This is the Hopkins White. Hopkins White, you can also get it from Aardvark Clay and Supply with uh, magnetite in it. And so this is the clear base on that specific clay body. So glazes on different clay bodies look a little bit different. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment too, because I've got a couple of other examples. And then lastly, we've got this one, which is called Orange Shino. Shino is another Japanese glaze. We get good breaks in this. This is a transparent glaze. Shino, I ended with this one in the, for, uh, at this point because Shino itself, it's kind of like, Shino kind of never went to kindergarten. So it doesn't like to play well with others. And if it does play well with, if it does play with others, it prefers to be underneath them, okay? So you can put some other color on top of a Shino, but you really can't put Shino on top of anything else. We're not gonna be doing a lot of mixing of colors, or we're doing no mixing of colors actually, but we might overlap just slightly because I'm gonna have two different ways that you guys can glaze your, or two or three different styles you can glaze your objects when we, when we get into the glaze studio and I start showing you that stuff, okay? So those are all of our glazes that we have to choose from. Now, I wanna show you this here. This is Vegas Red, and this is Vegas Red. Do they look the same? Do they even look similar? They kind of look similar, they're red, okay? But then look at this color right here. It's a much darker brown, and this one right here is a much lighter color. It's like a whitish green, right? The big thing that's happening here is that these are two different completely clay, diff different clay bodies, just like what we saw in the clear, right? Clear is on Black Mountain and Hopkins White. This is Hopkins White, we can see it right there the white portion of the clay. If I turn this over, look at how dark this clay body is, okay? That is the Black Mountain clay. So what I want you to understand, which we don't see a ton of it this semester, but maybe if you come and take intermediate and advanced classes, once we're back face to face and we get a little bit more studio time in here and we can experiment with a few more clay bodies, different clay bodies give different results when it comes to glazes, all right? Also, we've got these two, Winokur Yellow and Winokur Yellow, okay? These look completely different, okay? The only different, or the only one that kind of looks a little bit similar is right here on the rim where we have the most amount of that stuff, okay? So most amount of that stuff there. But this is on the Black Mountain Clay and this is on the Hopkins White. 